I'm going to kind of just introduce you to the concept of uh, baby positioning and why it matters. So I don't know about you guys, but before I knew anything, I just thought, what's the difference, right? Baby's in there, baby will come out. Like, no, it's really not that simple. Um, you know, why does it make a difference? And then talk about um, how we assess fetal eye. And so you'll kind of become familiar in your own mind with your where your babies are. And then, um, most importantly, then moving on to what are the factors that affect baby positioning. Specifically, there's, you know, three or four that you have no control over. And then there's the one that you do have some influence over, and that is your pelvic health, your spinal health, uh, this whole area here, just working to enhance it. And that's what um, Dr. Lindholm is going to talk about. So I might also just, well, I'm going to keep it for now, but I'm going to pass this around at some point. So this is my little, uh, it's just a mini version of a pelvis and a baby, but it's fairly accurate to scale, so you can kind of see the tight fit. So I want you to catch on. And I don't know, it's almost looks like a male pelvis. Maybe not. Anyway, so Dr. Lindholm has a pelvis here too. So first I thought I would just tell you my own testimony, and that's because um, the last workshop people said that it was helpful for them to hear it. So in 2003, I had a cesarean section, and it was uh, the primary indication for my C-section was a breach baby, a surprise breach. So I planned a home birth with a lay midwife. I had an eight-page birth plan, and I had words like an intimate, gentle, quiet, beautiful, and then I ended up with fairly emergent surgery. So I get to the hospital with a fever and a couple other things and they said, oh, your baby's breech. And I said, what does that mean? And I worked them through every scenario. Can you amio infuse me and vert the baby and deliver it vaginally? And they looked at me like I was crazy, you know, why would we do that? Let's just do surgery. So we had surgery, recovered fine, um, but went on and got pregnant. And I knew when I got pregnant the next time that I would be pursuing a VBAC, which stands for vaginal birth after cesarean, if you're not familiar with that term. And um, for me, it was just the fundamental philosophy that I know my body is meant to do something and it's capable of doing it. And if I could just find out how to help it do what it needs to do, that I would be okay. And so I did. And I took the class from the same woman that um, Dr. Lindholm mentioned, the midwife who is now in medical school, who was also a childbirth educator. And during the class, she talked about all the things that we talk about, nutrition and exercise and all that stuff. And then she said, you know, something that's kind of a, um, should get a lot more attention than it does is baby positioning. And it really struck a chord, obviously, because that was why I had a C-section. So I thought, well, yeah, of course I should be paying attention to this. So I got around 28 to 30 weeks, and my baby was breech. And it was, you know, kind of scary. I kind of started to panic. What am I going to do? I'm not having surgery again. I just, nobody will deliver a breech baby. How can, what can I do about it? And we began to look at a list of strategies of things that I could do. And she said, you need to find a doctor, a chiropractor who does the Webster technique. So I called around and I called Dr. Lindholm. And the thing I remember about him is that he talked to me personally on the phone and I thought that was really nice. He took time to just a cold call, just to answer some questions. And so I came to see him, and he'll probably explain this later, but his staff uses a thermal, thermal, right? Thermal mm -hmm. scanner. Went down my spine, and it was all fine. No problem, no problem, no problem, no problem, until he got down to about my lower lumbar sacral area, and then it went bright red. And he'll explain what that means. But anyhow, it showed that there was some constraint down here. There were some problems. And he said, aha, I think we're onto something here. This might be the issue. And so he began to work with me, and he did the Webster technique, and I began to see him on a regular basis. And after about the third visit, I went home, and he says, he would always say, I want you to, you know, take a, take a walk. Don't sit down right away, but, you know, keep active and then sit down. So I did. I took a little walk, and I sat down in my chair, and I remember when my daughter flipped. She just flipped, and then she stayed. So that was about 34 <laughs> to 35 weeks. And I went on and had a, a pretty um, un- I had a pretty very a very straightforward labor, and these are actually Katie's hands, Dr. Lindholm's. <laughs> she's helped. She's the one who uh, was Dr. Lindholm's wife's doula. But uh, so that's my daughter Eliana. And for anyone who there was a woman coming who's a prospective VBAC, and um, I can only tell you that it's a phenomenal feeling when you uh, know that your body is meant to do something, and then you finally get to do it. And so I am forever excited about this topic. Uh, so that's my own experience. And since, I've gone on and had another baby. He's almost two years old. And this time I knew better. So I got to see Dr. Lindholm early in the pregnancy, saw him all the way through. I uh, saw my midwife at 1 p.m. I saw Dr. Lindholm at 4.30 p.m. and said, I think I'm in early labor. 
he charted it on the computer, and my son was born at 11 hours later. So I'm convinced that last adjustment just got what he will tell you, he got all the interference out of the way. And it was so straightforward, and I, I don't want to use the word easy. If you've had a baby, you know it's not easy, but it was as good as you could get. <laughs> so, um, so what I want to talk about is I'm just going to mention, uh, when I teach childbirth classes, I teach a four-week series, I always talk to people in depth about prenatal planning and preparation. So I'm just going to mention these four things with obviously the topic tonight is baby positioning, so I'm going to hit hard on that one. So just to mention, as you're preparing for your baby, some of you are early in that process, some of you are real close there, right, Abigail? Mm -hmm. Almost done. <laughs> um, these uh, five things are the things that I pop out as probably the most important aspects. And number one is, is your care provider and the people that you choose to take you through prenatal care as well as the birth, uh, nutrition, exercise, preparing mentally and emotionally, and then of course baby positioning, which is our topic. So this, uh, this is an example, this is a client of mine, her name's Katie, and she, I have her permission to share this, obviously, and she had two home births and then decided on a hospital birth for personal reasons. And so she knew up front she was going to have to choose care providers that were, were going to honor her desires. Uh, so she chose a midwife. This is one of the midwives at Memorial. Nurse. Nice, young, new, sweet nurse. And nice, not so young, new doula over there. <laughs> so that's me. But anyway, um, so just an example of how we were all working together. So uh, I would just encourage you that if you have any concerns about anything that your care provider has said along the way, that you address it. A lot of times women have these red flags, but they don't listen to them because for whatever reason, my insurance doesn't, my insurance covers him or whatever, whatever it is. But um, your care provider really needs to be on board with your birth desires and how you see things going. So again, I'm just mentioning these things. Uh, nutrition, I think um, Dr. Lindholm, I know would echo me in this, that in overall health, it's got to be in the top two or three things that is the, the key. So, um, and how does it relate to baby positioning in your pelvis and all that stuff? Well, absolutely, you know, it's an integral part. So what you eat, here she's eating raw, she's eating colorful, she's eating fresh. Uh, if you do nothing else, eat raw, colorful, and fresh, and you'll be doing well. But it uh, affects your circulatory system and your respiratory system and your digestive system and certainly your tissue integrity. I mean, that's really important. Uh, your elasticity in all of of your areas. So, um, you know, Dr. Lindholm's not a miracle worker. He can adjust you all day long, but if you're not eating well, uh, you know, he can only do so much. So nutrition, highly important. Can't say enough about it. If you need uh, any recommendations or ideas, just let me know. Um, exercise. So um, I like this picture because these women are working on uh, their core muscles. So when you give birth, and ladies who don't know this already, most of you probably do, you're going to use muscles from your breast to your knees, and you might even use your extremity muscles a lot. You know, So women will go, why are my triceps sore? Right? And I'll say, oh, yeah, you were doing this. But anyhow, um, these women are doing exercises that are strengthening those muscles. So any kind of exercises, and we'll show you some, that you can be doing to be strengthening um, your abs, uh, and all these muscles here in the middle of your body, really important. Plus cardiovascular exercise is good too. You should be doing some of that. Don't feel like, oh, I have to go to the gym every day. It's not about that. Um, it's just about being healthy. For all healthy, the healthier you are, the better birth you're gonna have, just almost across the board. And then the mental, emotion, I like this picture. Mental <laughs> and emotional preparation, right? She looks so happy and nice. Um, Again, I'm just mentioning these things. If it was a prenatal class, we'd be talking in depth. But just knowing that, you know, knowing what to expect, knowing um, that it's going to hurt, right? What are you going to do about that when it hurts? And how to, um, having some strategies in place of how to deal with things. Having a doula is a good idea because she comes with strategies a lot of times. Um, addressing any kind of emotional things that can um, hold you back. So certainly stressors in your life. We know that stress releases hormones that actually counteract hormones that are good for you, so, and particularly in labor. So you want oxytocin to flow more than adrenaline. So uh, addressing stressful situations before they happen and um, preparing for that. So again, these are all just mentions, and now we'll get to the topic, right? I like that little boy, he's cute. So what about this baby positioning? Does it really matter? I mean, if I eat well and I do all those other things, what does it matter? Well, it really does matter, and I feel like I need to tell you why. So, um, 
this is just sort of my own opinion, and I feel like I should tell you if something's an opinion. But in general, babies really only come out one or two ways the best. Uh, so we think, you know, I used to think, well, what's the difference? Can't they just come out any old way? You know, feet, hands, <laughs> chin? No, really, they can't. And this is just basic physics. So when you study, you know, just, I mean, just looking at a simple picture, which I'll show you a few, basic anatomy and physiology, you'll see that babies are really intended to only come out one or two ways. Now, they can come out other ways. I've seen a, a, one baby born with a face presentation. I've seen two babies born directly posterior, which sunny side up, and I've seen one beautiful breech birth with a, a frank breech. But those are rare, and it's really not uh, done very often. So, you know, they're intended to come down, come out head first, and to rotate certain ways. So they really, that's just basic, basic anatomy and physics, anatomy and physiology. And secondly, healthcare providers are not trained to handle variations. So obviously you guys are here so you care, but I remember thinking, what's the big deal? Until I got to the hospital and they go, well, we don't do breaches. You know, you know, they thought I was crazy for even suggesting it. So unfortunately, most healthcare providers are not handled. And further, they're not even handled sometimes in the midst of, of you know, intrapartum, like while you're pregnant, I mean, while you're in labor, they don't really know what to do with it. I'm always shocked how many OBs don't assess fetal position when they're looking at dystocias and things like that. It's amazing. The U.S., here's my theory. I'm just going to lay it out for you. We have a one in three C-section rate in this country. Yeah, it's pretty hideous. That's double what the World Health Organization is recommending. So we think, you know, well, you're a smart country, right? Yeah, we're so smart that we have we cut babies out one out of three times. I've had one, so I'm not judging. But I know that there a lot of them are unnecessary. There's lots of reasons. At the moment, anyway, a doctor has to have a diagnosis to be able to do it. You can't walk in and just say, I'd like to have elective surgery. You know, um, I wouldn't be surprised if we get there at some point, but we're not there yet, thankfully. So they still have to have a reason, and these are the common reasons, and I wish I had a nickel for every client I've ever had who has had something like this, at least spoken over them. And uh, that number one is that failure to progress, that FTP. Have any of you ever heard that before? A friend or somebody say, yeah, we hear it all the time. And this is, you know, mom's Maybe she got up to four or five centimeters and just never got any farther. Maybe she got up to eight or nine and just never got any farther. And these are all sort of like, you look back and you, you, you do some Monday morning quarterbacking and you go, oh man, really? You know, we could have tried this or we could have tried that. Um, and then the CPD, which is the cephalopelvic disproportion, basically saying your baby's head is too big for your pelvis. And what you're going to discover is that unless there's something really literally wrong with you, you're not going to grow a baby that's too big for your body. Um, it just doesn't really work. And we do have different diets now than we had, you know, a couple hundred years ago or whatever. But um, really, for the most part, if you grow a baby, you can probably push the baby out. Um, so another one that, um, the baby this morning that I was at the birth, 6 pounds, 13 ounces, just a little, little guy, 20 inches long. So he's 20 inches long and his head is 13 and 3 quarters, right? So decent size head, right, for a small baby, um, he fit through just fine. Breaches and other malpositions, it's obviously indication, and then previous C-sections. So a lot of people that have a previous C-section don't have a lot of options, pretty much, uh, are almost, almost uh, not guaranteed, but having a, a, a subsequent C-section is a lot of your only option. So my theory is that the uh, that a lot of these are related to malpositioned babies. That's just my theory. Just talking to people and I hear, oh yeah, my baby was sunny side up and, and that's why, or this or that, or we hear, I hear about just a baby whose head was cocked, just a little funny, and you think, yeah, that's what was making your labor kind of slow and long. And so my theory is if we can correct uh, fetal position issues, we can reduce the cesarean section rate, right? So I'm on a mission. Um, even, even if vaginal, so suppose those births don't go surgical, um, malpositioned babies are associated with inefficient labor patterns, longer labors. Um, I'm not asking you guys, but if you've ever had that, it just, it just is awful. Um, having painful contractions are not doing much. Inordinate pain, so don't have to raise your hand, but anybody ever had back labor or heard of somebody who had back labor? Yeah, it's pretty awful. And so we expect labor to hurt, but we don't expect mom to say, I feel like there's an alien crawling out of my back. And when that happens, you know, it's like, oh, something a little bit inordinate. 
And then need for interventions, obviously. Those moms, we even transfer from home and try to get her an epidural if we can. So, and VAD stands for vacuum assisted. Maternal exhaustion, obviously, is associated with all of that, and then certainly birth trauma. I know a woman who is still, four years later, just, she can't quite get over her long, hard posterior labor. So now that I've made you all so happy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, what I'm, I know, what I'm trying to do is tell you, like, this is why. Like, all of these things are related back to simply having a baby that's not optimally positioned. Um, all right, so that is the optimal position. And what you're going to see here is uh, the most common position, and it's called LOA, which I'll explain in a minute. But we've got a baby whose bottom is where it's supposed to be, whose head is where it's supposed to be, and whose back is where it's supposed to be. And this baby is in a great position to make his or her way out. Um, so just kind of know that. When I was working on my daughter, I don't know if I ever showed up at the office here, but I used to uh, tape a picture just like this, tape it on my belly, and just walk around the house and look at it in the mirror and put it on the mirror. And I don't know that it did anything, but it <laughs> made me kind of think, you know, this is what you're supposed to do, and I would talk to her and say, get your head where it's supposed to go. But that is kind of the optimal position. Well, how do we help the baby get there? That's the question. Again, just another example, just to kind of show you. Here's a term, baby. Not a lot of room, right? But you can kind of see just physically why this is the best position. We're going to have molding here on this head, right? You've seen your babies come out with kind of a cone head. So it's going to come out kind of... Um, pointy, right? It's much easier to get out than a foot or a shoulder or whatever. Um, yeah, so just anatomically you can kind of get an idea. What else do I like about this picture? Just for foreshadowing, just notice the spine there. It's stuck to when we talk about it. And for all you sweet ladies, um, look at her bladder. Yeah. So if you need to get up and use the bathroom, nobody finds fault with you, just go. Okay, and just a quick, I, I'll explain this in a minute, but um, you can kind of see here's the baby the way it's supposed to be. So it's the front of mom, it's the back of mom. This baby's going to mold and come right out here real easy, right? This baby has a big old flat head that's not even touching the cervix. So you can kind of see why this baby is going to come out much easier than this one. And these do eventually make it, uh, many, sometimes, um, but this one is much, much more likely to happen. And it almost looks like the birth canal itself for this baby is shorter mm -hmm. than the birth canal here, which is kind of interesting. And you definitely don't have good application of the head on the cervix. You've got to have pressure on the cervix for it to open. All right, so how do we assess fetal lie? Well, let me just tell you, this would be a red flag to me. If my uh, physician or midwife were not checking the baby from about 30 weeks on, I would be concerned about that. That would be a red flag because it is so important. So um, around 20 to 30 weeks, a baby is going to get its head down. Can you think of why? Why would a baby's head go down? It doesn't look comfortable. I mean, the answer is super, super obvious. It's heaviest. So gravity. It's just all. It's just that simple. The heaviest part. So again, 20-inch baby, 13 and a half inch head, 13 three quarters inch head. So. Um, you know, my son had a 14 and a half inch head. It's a big head. It's heavy. <laughs> so gravity just brings the baby down. Uh, now, if your baby, you know, if you're at 28 weeks and your baby's not head down, don't freak out. If you're 34 weeks and your baby's not head down, then that's something to begin thinking about. So they, they go head down up until, I don't know, pretty close to the end, 34, 35, even 36 weeks. They have some room to move side to side, but they shouldn't be moving top to bottom anymore once they're at that point. So that's what you would want to see. Um, so how do we assess this? Well, hopefully your care provider is able to do something called Leopold's maneuvers, and that's what this is. And um, a good nurse can do this, good midwife, um, a good physician, hopefully. And what they're doing is they check up here, we, at the top of the uterus, called the, the fundus of the uterus, and we feel for the babies, what we hope is the thought, right? And then um, we walk our hands down the baby's back. And I'm telling you this for a reason, because you can actually do some of this on yourself, or dads can do this on moms. It's really fun. And I have a handout to show you how to do it. Um, and then we reach down and we feel the head. So you know how your midwife puts her fingers right here and she wobbles that head back and forth. She has to dig in a couple inches to do it. Um, and we're just making sure it's a head. So we wobble for a reason. If you wobble, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can tell what, what's moving. You, 
with your hands, you can tell what it is, whether it's a head or a butt, usually. And then here we're checking to see if the baby's head is flexed or um, extended. So just just so you know. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. How would that work for women who possibly carry most of their weight in their abdomen? Yeah, I will be honest. It's a little trickier for fluffier women, sort of, but um, it is doable because you get to a point where, I mean, when you're 32 weeks pregnant, you're still going to be a baby, even if you have some adipose tissue that's covering. We can feel. Okay. Yeah, and it shouldn't hurt. This shouldn't hurt at all when we do this. But that's a good question. It does make a difference. You know, when you have those little, you know, 110 pound moms that are just basketball belly, you can almost see them sometimes. You know? <laughs> but um, I was not one of those moms. <laughs> so, this is, yeah, good question. All right, so just, as, just as for your information, um, how do we. Uh, cal oh, what's the word I want to say? Categorize baby position. Well, it's just like everything else in healthcare. It has an acronym, mm -hmm. right? So we've talked about SPD and RLP and whatever. So basically, it's a three-letter acronym, and um, these are just the four common ones. And the first letter stands for right or left. You've probably guessed. So we want to know, and I should have brought a bigger doll. Which <laughs> um, which uh, side of the mother the bulk of the baby is? So that would be your right or left. So again, your common one is going to be on the left side. It's okay if your baby's on the right, but left is most common. Um, and then your O, everybody should hopefully have an O, and your O stands for occiput, and that's the back of your head, the occipital lobe, occipital bone, and that's what's presenting in the pelvis. So you always want an O in your three letters. And then your A or P, now this is pretty important. So your A or P stands for posterior, which means back, back of the mother or A for anterior, which means the front of the mother. So we want to know, is the baby's back mostly towards the mom's front, or is he turned around and mostly towards the mom's back? And I always remember posterior just means back to back. So your posterior babies are the ones that you hear um, back labor, back pain, uh, those kinds of things. So you can kind of get a sense here. And it looks like, I mean, if you just look at it, you think, what's the difference? I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Well, it can really be that big of a deal. Um, so know your three letters. And you can really impress your midwife or doctor if you go, is my baby LOA? <laughs> 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 so I always, yeah. How um, much does your placent placental positioning affect? Yeah, it does. I, and I will get to that, Abigail, because that's exactly right. That's one of the factors over which you have no control. Babies uh, tend to face their placentas. And so if your placenta is anterior, which the one today was at the birth I was at, um, it's like a little more likely maybe that the baby will be turned and facing it. So good question, and I'll get to that too. So yeah, that's terribly blurry, so forget it. But I've got a handout that has it on. It's just the compass rose is what they call it. Um, but it kind of shows all the different positions. And there's some of that on your handout. So I'm not even kidding that I encourage you to take a stuffed animal. So like I had a giraffe, I'm not joking, and would just sit there and kind of play around until I figured out what part was the baby. Um, and then these are just some of your non-optimal. <laughs> Please do not have these positions. So um, your frank breach, which is the most common breach, it's really not that dangerous, uh, particularly for a tried a, a tried pelvis. Um, but people just don't aren't don't learn them anymore. Complete breach, footling, you know, you can look on the internet and see some of these births, like it's pretty cool, but um, I've only ever seen a Frank. Um, this one, I've seen one face presentation, the M there stands for the mandible, so um, it's where the baby's coming out face first, so his head is hyperextended rather than flexed. And here's a true transverse lie, and if I'm, I don't know if it's the placenta or not, that would not be good if it is, but um, so. None of you are going to have any of this. It's just to kind of show you all the different options. All right, so what factors influence the baby's position? The size and shape of your pelvis. So unless you were, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to name them and then go through it. So the si size and shape of your pelvis, the size of the baby, obviously the amount of fluid, the placental placement, which Abigail uh, mentioned, and then your pelvic and musculoskeletal health, which Dr. Lincoln is going to talk about. So um, size and shape of your pelvis. This is a female pelvis. Don't worry about all those labels. Um, as you can see, it looks... Uh, I think that one's more male. This looks male to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But you get the same concept. Um, and 
for us, for us women, our pelvises are normally shaped kind of round, you know, round like that. Some women are a little bit more oblong one way or oblong the other way. Some women even have a heart-shaped pelvis. It's kind of pretty in pictures, but it's not so great for a baby <laughs> positioning. Um, you have no control over this. I mean, this is just how you were born, um, maybe your development along the way, unless you've had an injury. I had a client once who had crushed her pelvis in a car accident and was simply not able to deliver vaginally. Um, so, I mean, you, you can't change the shape of your pelvis. Certainly if you eat well and things like that, that might all help, but you're not, you know, this is just genetics. This is what you got. Um, what was I going to say along those lines? Yeah, I think that's it. So that's something that you have no, oh, I know what I was going to say. You can't look at a woman and say, oh, oh, she's got nice wide hips, so she's, you know, going to do great in childbearing. It's not like that, right? Your skeletons are... You can't, yeah, we're not talking about the size of your hips. So I've seen little 4'11", 100 pound women with very roomy pelvises. And I've seen, you know, 200 pound, 6 foot women with tiny pelvises. So don't think that this is based on size necessarily. Um, so then we talked about, let's see, uh, the size of the baby. So um, you might grow, a bit, you know, anywhere from a 6 pounder to a 10 pounder. Just going to depend. And, um... You don't have much control over that. It's possible by cutting your sugars you might grow a little smaller baby, but um, you don't have much control. Larger babies, um, both of them have their good and bad points. So um, a smaller baby has more room to move, and a smaller baby has more room to move. <laughs> so it can be good or bad. Um, a larger baby doesn't have as much room to move, but that can be good if he or she gets into a good position and stays there. Um, so again, you have not much control over the size of your baby or what your baby does, by the way. During an ultrasound at about, oh, 28 weeks, I saw my son playing with his umbilical cord like this. I'm not kidding. He had it in his hand and was playing with it. Stop that. But anyway, um, so you don't have much control over the size of your baby or the amount of your amniotic fluid. Um, when you're term and you're about ready to deliver, you have about a liter of amniotic fluid, although I will just say you don't have much control over it, but you definitely want to stay hydrated. Um, lots of fluid, more room for the baby to move, less fluid, less room. So when I showed up at the hospital, I had been ruptured, my waters had been broken for two days, and there was no room to move the baby even if I wanted to. So that's why I said, can you amnio infuse, you know, basically squirt some water in there and turn the baby, but wasn't, they weren't having any of that. So anyhow, um, Amniotic fluid also affects the baby's position. And then the placental placement, like um, Abigail mentioned, babies tend to want to, if I go back to, well, I guess it's in this picture too, yeah. So this placenta is high and on the back of the uterus, which is ideal, perfect. But um, sometimes they're here in the front. What we never want to see is a low line placenta. But um, if they're in the front, you know, they might be tempted to turn to face up placenta. Um, I mean, ultimately, in the end, they'll turn, they'll rotate, and they'll come out, usually. But, and you have no control over where your placenta is that I know of, unless you guys know something I don't. Um, and then, certainly, your pelvic and musculoskeletal health, and that's where I'm going to let Dr. Lindholm tell you. I just stuck this picture up there. I have no idea what those arrows mean or anything. <laughs> but, anyway, just to, I did want to kind of just show you the sway back and, um, and just, you know, and I'm sure Dr. Lindholm is going to go tell you about just the stress that um, uh, pregnancy puts on your spine. And then um, I also wanted to include this, um, unless he probably has a similar slide, but so also... I don't have that slide, so okay. remember that picture, because I'm going to refer to it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just knowing that um, it's not just your bones. Exactly. Um, yeah, you've got particularly this broad ligament, which is on the other side, but it comes down and it actually attaches to your spine. So, you know, most women in labor, even if they um, have a perfectly aligned baby, have some back pain. And that's because when you have a uterine contraction, it pulls on that broad ligament. And then here's your best friend, Kelly, right here, your round ligament um, that goes down into your inguinal area. And that can also um, be affected by your pelvic health. But your uterus is a big muscle container, basically, and it's got these ligaments that are attaching it. And uh, it can be pretty ouchy if it's out of line. I have this handout I wanted to give to you because one of the things I do tell people, um, I'll let Dr. Lindholm give you all his advice, but I always uh, talk to people in my classes about their posture. And so I'm looking at you all, you guys look pretty good. Yeah. So two feet on the floor, right, sitting up, 
upright, uh, pillows behind your back when you need to, shoulders straight and up. Um, and then also, so one last thing before Dr. Lindholm tells you, you know, the meat of the evening. Um, let's suppose that you show up at your labor, so to speak, and you've got, you know, a posterior baby. Or just, you know, sometimes babies can have something just as simple as a little hand. It's so cute in the ultrasound picture, but it's not so cute <laughs> when you're in labor. Um, what can you do? Is there anything you can do about it? Well, yes. And I think I could, you know, I could sit and list for you 14 uh, or 40 different things that you could do. But I think the key is to have somebody who knows what she's doing to help you. So this doula is doing something called the double hip squeeze, which is a real favorite. We do it a lot. Um, but having somebody who knows this stuff, who's familiar with this stuff, who has ideas and says, well, we can try this position or we can try that position or we can um, try our double hip squeeze or we can use or, you know, some heat or we can use a rebozo or a sling. Um, but I wouldn't want you to despair if you're in labor. I would just tell you that most babies resolve. So sometimes you have bouts of early contractions that help them, you know, get into a better position. And I've seen them spiraling on the way out, and I go, you naughty baby, you know, <laughs> posterior and spirals its way out. Um, but with good help and good strategies, uh, it, you know, it can be done. So Dr. Lindholm is going to tell you now all the exciting things about your pelvis.